<laughs> but I invite that participation. It's nice to see everybody's faces. Uh, and also welcome uh, to the, the town hall tonight for Arts Are Education. Um, my name is Aaron Knockle, and uh, I work at uh, Penn State University in the art education program. But um, one of the big things about um, being a part of this meeting is that uh, this town hall is a part of a larger initiative that is working with NCAS to promote an initiative around the arts are education, an initiative that would help to advocate in your local school systems and hopefully create a national movement to make sure that the arts aren't overlooked as we go back to face-to-face -face education in the fall. Um, I also want to elevate and highlight the fact that this is a media arts town hall, uh, which I'm particularly proud to be a part of. Uh, I've been working with a small um, group of stakeholders in a media arts committee, um, which is working hard to develop a national network of media arts educators. There's so much um, power and important work that's happening in media arts across so many different disciplines. Uh, truly, it is a, a, an incorporation of all the arts. We see media arts professionals in theater and dance, um, in music, in the visual arts. I, I myself come from the visual arts. So uh, it's a really exciting, expanding space. Um, of course, the National Core Arts have really elevated that space by dedicating a, a set of national standards to the media arts. And so I see this meeting as kind of doing two things. One is really shouting uh, for the Arts Our Education Initiative and supporting that initiative, but also beginning to develop a, a professional organization and a professional identity around the media arts. Um, so that's really uh, an exciting part of tonight's meeting. Um, we have a number of participants here in, in the beginning, sort of half, and then we're going to open things up for more of a Q&A, uh, for some story sharing, for some questions about the initiative and try and address any questions you might have and what you might be able to do in your local um, school networks, um, but also to connect you, possibly this, this movement. Riley, so I would ask honey, that you press that mute button if you're not on the mic, and uh, we certainly understand that um, our Zoom worlds are filled with all kinds of kids and pets and all kinds of things. So certainly we, we understand that. Um, and uh, let me go ahead and introduce uh, uh, Jim Palmarini, who is uh, gonna be giving us a quick intro of the toolkit for arts art education. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my mic on mute and hand it over to Jim. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, I'm so glad to be here to be able to share with you an overview of the arts art education campaign. I view my job here is to give you the basics and then I want to get out of the way so you can have a rich discussion about media arts. So yes, uh, Aaron uh, noted that uh, the uh, arts art education campaign is in support of all of the arts, including media arts, and it is sponsored by the National Coalition for Core Arts Standards, uh, of which all of the member organizations are listed here. So um, to cut to the quick, really quickly, um, in the first place, this campaign was inspired by a document called Arts Education is Essential that was issued back in April when the pandemic uh, was taking hold. And there was a sense that uh, among NCAS members and others that we needed to speak up and to reassert the value of arts education for all of our students. And that particular focus focused on some really fundamental things, uh, social and emotional learning, the fact that the arts create safe and nurturing spaces, and they are to remind everyone that they are part of a well-rounded curriculum as defined by federal law. So time has passed. Who knew that a year later we would still be uh, all in quarantine and doing virtual uh, distance learning and teaching? But we are. And the results of that put in another call to action uh, by NCAS and to others to really address this in a more um, active way, a, a way to act, act, you know, advocate and get people involved. Because here are the issues that are now before us as a result of the pandemic. Profound budget shortfalls throughout the country. State budgets in general are falling short. They simply don't have the revenue they need to support all things, including education. Yes, there will be a relief bill. Yes, there will be education money in it, but it won't be near enough to really take care of all the things and you see them on this bulleted list, learning loss and a focus on remediation. In other words, 
there is a lot of discussion around the fact that students are literally falling off the map, so to speak, in learning. And there is a call for a very, very focused uh, program that focuses on things like math and English, that there is learning loss. And what I would say to that is we believe there is learning loss in the arts as well. But the point is that kind of focus can come at the expense of arts education. We all know it's the same old story. The arts are the first thing to get cut in the budget. And that is truer than ever. And there is student, family, faculty trauma. We have all been traumatized by the pandemic. I would say this is both a challenge and an opportunity for arts education to be at the center of the education discussion as we re-enter the in-person uh, environment, because we know what arts can do about social and emotional learning. We know about theater and other arts empathy ability, and everybody needs to be more comfortable and feel safe. We think the arts can help. And yes, there's a continued need for personal protective equipment that is very, very acute in the performing arts classroom. We know this to be true. There's going to be challenges around paying for that. And I'm not so sure in all cases that state budgets are gonna provide the funds for that. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, this campaign is what we're doing about it. We have to mobilize everyone as listed here, teachers, colleagues, administrators, students, legislators, everyone who believes that school-based education in the arts must be available to all students. And, and I, will, I will apologize briefly by suggesting that theater is in fact an independent art form. Of course, it is among all the arts, including music. That's a joke. So <laughs> moving on, the campaign core ask. It's pretty fundamental. Art should be made central to a well-rounded education and fully funded to support the well-being of students and the entire school community. So what, we, what we're asking is based on three particular actionable uh, activities. One is to sign a pledge, another is for school boards to pass a resolution, and another is for uh, folks to write their uh, state legislators. And I'm gonna review those tools here in more detail in a second. But right now, more than anything else, um, besides signing the pledge, and by the way, in the chat, I have put the link to both the uh, Arts Our Education homepage and the pledge. In the time I am speaking to you, you can go in inside the pledge if you have not. But right now, we're really laser focused on getting school boards to actually pass the resolution that will assert that they will support arts education funding in their schools for the 2021-22 school year. Right now, in many places, school boards are deep in the discussions and drafts of school budgets for next year. Some of them are farther along than others, but in many cases, the process wraps up by the early spring. So um, now's the time to get at the table. And that's what we're urging folks to do. So yeah, launching the campaign. Well, this is part of that campaign launch, the town halls. We've done theater, we've done, um, uh, dance, now we're doing media arts, and right behind you as we speak, yes, it's coming, visual arts and then music. And uh, that will all sort of culminate in a last event called the Arts Education Capitol Hill Month kickoff, in which there's a federal component to this where we're asking folks to go to Capitol Hill and to meet with their uh, national, their uh, legislators, their senators, and their uh, house reps. So there are the basics, and I just addressed these in number two, doing all of those things, pledge, resolution, letter, to help us really activate in a very coordinated way. So yes, moving on. What's the pledge? Well, pulling from the pledge, the arts are part of a balanced education, providing America's learners with crucial skills and knowledge they need to be productive college and career ready individuals. The resolution. Whereas, there are lots of whereas statements in this uh, resolution, all students have the right to an arts education that include dance, media arts, music theater, and visual arts taught by certified arts educators in partnership with community providers. The one thing I want to say about the resolution is um, deliberately a Word document, not a PDF, because the expectation is that some schools and districts will not necessarily be able to meet all of the things articulated in the resolution. 
we want to make it as easy as possible for school boards to actually pass a resolution that affirms that they value arts education and they're going to fund it within the parameters of their existing arts programs. We want to make it easy. We don't want to be obstructionist about it. So it's editable, in other words. The state rep template letter. We use something called GovPredict, which is a voter voice type tool. Maybe some of you have used that where you sign in, put your zip code in, and bang, it takes you immediately to your state legislators. That's right, the folks in your backyard that are making decisions that affect your daily life and that of your students. It takes you to a template letter that is editable, that asks the um, legislator to, in the first place, actually fund education in the state next year fully, and then in turn to reach out to um, school districts and ask them to fund arts education in, in the schools within their district. So yes, please fully fund public education, including the arts, through this in this year's budgeting process. So the Dear Educator Letter. Well, this is for you as an educator, but actually this is also customizable. It's a Word doc that can be adjusted for parents, for administrators, for anybody that you want to reach out to, to ensure that they in turn will reach out to the school board or to others to actually support the well-being of students and the entire school community. This is one of those momentum builders. You know, it's not six degrees of separation, it's just one degree of separation between you and somebody else making that pitch. That's how really good advocacy works. That's why this campaign is in for the long haul. It's called a campaign right now, but what it really is, is it's a movement. We are seeking culture change. And in that culture change, a re-understanding of the mainstream about the true value of arts education. And let me just say this, that would most certainly include media arts because people don't get it and you need for them to get it. Media arts is here to stay. We know that the people in the PTA and the business community may not know that. At least we haven't articulated it to them yet. So yeah, here is that Dear School Board letter, also editable. It's pretty straightforward. It says pretty much all of the things that I just explained. Support those programs in 2021 and 22 and beyond. Ideally, what we would like to see is this movement to be sustainable uh, for example, that schools will actually reaffirm their commitment to arts education annually and re-up the resolution. Maybe we'll have stickers that said, yes, I passed the resolution. I think actually our, uh, our, our art would look really good on a t-shirt. So uh, yes, campaign talking points. All of these things, by the way, are on the website and are downloadable. You can do whatever you like with them. Get them, use them. All programs continue to be funded. Classes are offered across all arts disciplines and appropriately scheduled. And that's in proportion to other areas, subject areas. Curriculum and schedule and design to less learning loss address includes the arts. Arts educators continue to be employed and teach in the disciplines for which they were trained. This is a biggie. Um, there are those of us out in the field who have heard these stories. Maybe you have two of arts educators being repurposed to teach math, English, gym, whatever you got in which there is some sort of uh, deficiency in the faculty. You're trained arts educators. You're professionals. You have expertise. You have knowledge. You have skill. You should be able to teach what you're trained in. Instruction resources should be available for the arts program at all times. Professional development for arts educators needs to be appropriate and comparable to that of other subject area teachers. This is actually a longstanding challenge for all arts educators instead of the cookie cutter professional development, something that actually addresses your art form. Facilities built and furnished for art activities used for that purpose. I have a picture that I can't show to you, but it is a picture of a stage door in which on that stage door is posted no, no entrance for COVID patients only. I think that sums it up. An arts education evaluation is done in the larger context of professional development and mindful of the new norms of practice adopted under the pandemic era. In other words, um, all of this distant learning uh, has been done on short notice. Nobody exactly knew what they were getting into. We're flying the plane and building it at the same time. We know there are wonderful examples of distance learning practice and pedagogy out there. 
but we don't really have a full understanding of what they, those are. So that means that the training, the evaluation of educators ought to be done with that in mind. They got into something that they were not prepared to do and it's not fair to judge them um, in any larger context. So I wanna wrap it up here quickly. Let me just say, you know, everybody, arts educators, you're great, media, whatever you are, but you have to be your own best advocate because you know what you're talking about. So speak up for yourself. And by the way, if you have students, students are the absolute best advocates for arts education because to me, they are a walking, talking affirmation of what arts education does. Great communicators, smart, they show up, they get off book. They are the best because they are passionate as well. But this is what you can do now. Visit the arts education website. It's gonna tell you lots of things, it's gonna get you going, sign that pledge. Reach out to your school board, write your state letter, leg state legislators. And this is really important. If you sign that pledge, there's a little box in there that, off that allows you to comment. Eventually we're gonna create uh, a page and some guidance to create stories. I was talking to somebody earlier, we love data. We live and die, data-driven, data-driven. However, is there anything more powerful than your own art story? We all have one. When we were doing a pre-meeting with Aaron and Dane and so forth, I heard a I heard a great story, you know, by one of the presenters here tonight that was talking about her experience as a media arts student and what that's meant to her. That's it. Tell your story. So that's it for me. Thank you for your patience. And I am going to stop sharing and get out of the way now. Thank you again. Great. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, Jim's going to hang out with us a little bit. There'll be time for a Q&A more towards the end of the hour. And uh, he can sort of give us any particulars and answer any clarifying questions that you might have about the campaign or what he called a movement, which I really love to, to reset the kind of cultural expectations around art education and expectations that we have for our local schools. Uh, I'm going to pass off to my colleague, Dane Olson, who has been a part of our uh, Media Arts Committee initiative um, and also is coming from sunny California. Uh, actually, most of our panelists, I think all of them, actually, I'm so jealous. My house is encased in ice right now in Pennsylvania. So, uh, Dane, if you could take over from here. And Okay, well, great. Thank you, Aaron. You just kind of glitched out there for a second. Little media art artifact right there. Welcome to the media arts world here in uh, remote learning and, and distance meetings. I'm Dane Olson. I'm in LAUSD. You can see our logo up there. LAUSD is the LAUSD building here. I teach in LAUSD. Uh, I've been an administrator there and uh, developed a number of uh, media arts programs in LAUSD. So right now I'm at a, Bel a Belmont High School downtown LA. And um, I'm going to be leading a panel here of guests, including uh, Emily Francisco Silva, who is my student personally at Belmont High School, who's going to be talking about herself and her experience. Billy Marie Lubiano Robinson uh, was a student in LAUSD and is now a professional media artist doing web and application development. Um, and she'll be talking about her experience. And Bryce Johnson, who is currently at Cathedral High School in Palm, the Palm Springs area. Um, and those will be our panelists. I'll be kind of leading the panel, but also talking about myself briefly uh, and, and kind of included in the panel just to kind of round out the conversation. So to begin, uh, if you, all you panelists are ready, um, we'll begin with introductions. My introduction is that I started out uh, as a media artist and exhibiting professionally, doing kind of experimental work between theater and performance and installation. And that involved a lot of city video, sound, uh, multiple monitors, uh, several tracks of video, and I would create environments out of that. And it was very experimental work. And so I wasn't really making a lot of money. <laughs> so I did become a teacher um, and have been a teacher ever since. And so that's amounted about over 30 years, uh, maybe even longer of educating in classrooms, outside of classrooms with media arts primarily. Although I started as a special education teacher in LAUSD and 
quickly realized that I needed alternative means of uh, reaching my students who were challenged with the core curriculum. And I um, ended up using a lot of arts and media arts in my classroom and uh, develop whole curriculums out of that. And then um, actually from there moved on to other programs, was a media arts teacher in a number of schools and then an administrator in LAUSD. And to speak to the fragile nature of the arts and education, I was laid off and displaced several times in those positions because the arts were cut. At, you know, when economics uh, are challenged, the arts are seen as the frivolous and expendable end of education, unfortunately. So I've had personal experience with that. I led the writing of the standards at the national level, working with Aaron here. Uh, with this Media Arts Committee under National Coalition for Core Arts Standards and developing and promoting media arts as a separate discipline and hoping to establish it in uh, across the country and within states so it's firmly embedded within uh, K-12 education. At this point, I want to introduce the panelists again and have them uh, tell us their story. So introduce who you are, tell us your story. And I'm going to go round robin uh, from oldest to youngest, uh, starting there with Bryce Johnson. If you want to tell us your story, Bryce, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. And just to reiterate a few things. Uh, so like was mentioned, um, I teach um, video production at um, Cathedral City High School, and that uh, school is in the district of Palm Springs Unified. And I've only been there about four years. However, I do teach an academy that is a little over 20 years old. Um, and if you're not familiar with academy structures in California, um, they started kind of developing academies in uh, high school, realizing that a lot of students were lost and kind of, you know, being able to um, kind of focus them. And my academy is um, structured around, um, you know, digital arts and technology and different things like that. So I specifically teach digital storytelling. And when I think about a story that has meaning um, to me, I have, I have so many stories that came up, but the most recent thing that I was just currently working on was um, a curriculum that I developed over the last year. And I actually worked with Aaron Knockle to develop um, curriculum that utilized um, you know, the, the things that I teach, which is digital storytelling, but trying to utilize that to cultivate self-care. And so I had the opportunity to um, implement that this um, past. I literally just finished probably about two weeks ago. Um, um, implementing that unit. And that unit was extremely powerful, seeing the stories that came from it and seeing the transformation of the students um, really uh, blew me away. And anytime, if any of you guys have developed curriculum, you know there's that fear of when you start to implement, is this, is this going to work? Is this going to um, take hold? And, and not to mention, you know, when I started the curriculum, I didn't realize it was going to be distance learning, you know? And so um, realizing that it had to be implemented in a different way and seeing it work uh, in that situation, seeing it work uh, in a way that I believe was transformative for my students, was transformative for me, um, was just a really powerful um, environment that was created through the arts. And I just, uh, I feel so privileged to be a part of it. I feel so privileged that I was able to make it and spend that much time developing curriculum and to, 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 to be with the curriculum and watch it grow. And so that was um, something that was really powerful. And I'm working towards making the distance learning um, more accessible for my students. And I'm working with the district to develop um, a program where we're able to check out laptops to all of my juniors and seniors, which is um, I think about 40 laptops is what I'm, I'm trying to get and uh, looks like it will happen. But it's been one of those things that has been just a, a, an, ex, an extremely, um, I think, humbling and learning experience. So that's what I have to share for today. Thanks so much, Bryce. That was great. Uh, our next guest is Billy Marie Luviano Robinson. So go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dane, thanks for the intro. Bryce, great to hear from you. I'm excited to be part of this campaign, this panel. I am 
formerly an LAUSD student. I graduated uh, several years ago. I won't date myself, but I will say that I'm very proud to have graduated from Cleveland High School's Media Academy. That's actually where Dane and I met. Uh, I was very interested in experimental art, specifically experimental video. I had created a uh, documentary experimental video hybrid called Sugar Water that focused on my explorations as a uh, multicultural individual and what that meant. It ended up going through the award circuit. As a student, that meant a lot to me. I ended up studying film as well as poetry at Cal State Northridge here in LA. Uh, after that, I went into the professional world as a coder, as Dane mentioned in my intro. I now work for Pepperdine University as their mobile app developer uh, and outside of my professional work as a coder. I am still a multimedia artist at heart. I am still working on uh, multimedia pieces through video and in-person experiences. Of course, the in-person experiences have taken a hold with COVID, much like everyone. Uh, but I'm looking forward to engaging in this panel and talking about how important media arts is in terms of education, especially as someone who's involved in education right now. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Bill and Marie. And next we have Emily uh, Francisco. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Francisco. Um, I'm a senior at Belmont High School, like Mr. Olson said. Um, and I'm in the Multimedia Academy um, and I'll be attending college in the fall and I'm currently like in between like studying film or psychology. I'm thinking maybe I'll do both um, and much like um, Billy Marie, I am also from like LUSD and um, one thing I'd like to say is that coming from like a low income family and living in like a predominantly Hispanic and Latinx community with very limited resources um, looking back, I can tell that I've always viewed art as a privilege or as a luxury that my family couldn't really provide for me. Um, and I think many people in, in my area can relate to that. Um, we just don't really have the money to afford what we would like um, in, in, the art, in the art area or just like regarding arts. Um, and so I'm very excited to have been accepted to film school and hopefully I'll be, I'll be able to attend. Um, but yeah, I just wanna highlight that arts and funding for arts in, in high schools is very important. As for me, I had a, a summer internship last, last year um, and I really put to practice what I had learned in my graphic design classes um, and it was just really important and kind of like a life-changing moment where I realized that art has really been a passion of mine, but it's just something I wasn't really able to explore because of the lack of money and, and funding that there is in schools. And so, yeah, I just want to say that, that it's just very important to like highlight the importance of art and the impact that it has on its students. Great. That's wonderful, Emily. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, question will be uh, sharing a story uh, that gives some idea of what uh, media arts does in the classroom and the impact that it has uh, for you within education and the classroom. In my own experience, for example, I had a student uh, when I was just beginning to teach media arts in the classroom, we was doing a video production class, a filmmaking class, and students were doing an independent project at that point, a little more advanced towards the end of the year. And I had a 10th grader who worked on our own project that was about uh, cultural appropriation. She was a, a African-American um, uh, slash Latino student, and she did it about uh, cultural appropriation of, um, of Black culture and how um, you know, how much people were enthusiastic about Black culture, particularly in music and, and so forth, uh, hip hop, and how it had been adopted by other cultures. And she did an expose of that that was just like amazing. She's in 10th grade, uh, and it was about a 10 minute film. And it was just powerful. It was just incredibly uh, insightful, intelligent. Um, 
and dynamic. The way that she edited it, it was just uh, constantly moving, asking questions, inquiring, having student interviews and so forth and multi very multimedia. And uh, I could see how that had changed her. It had empowered her. She suddenly felt that she had a voice and uh, that her thoughts mattered. And her film actually got shown at the LA Film Festival alongside of other professional films. And it was just an amazing experience. So next, uh, uh, Bryce, maybe you could share an impact story for you. Absolutely. When you were telling that story, it made me think about um, about four years ago, I had, um, I was teaching at a different school, I guess it was about six years ago. And um, I had a small advanced class, about 15 students. And we became um, really a family over the years. And we, um, um, we had uh, this interesting kind of dynamic and we had a two hour block out of the day where we would be together for two hours. So it was a lot of time that we spent together. And I remember one of the students' uh, mother had cancer and um, she ended up passing away and he took off about two months of school. And um, he had a choice to finish out the school year with, um, on independent study or come back. And I remember he made a decision to come back. And when he came into class, he came to me and said, your class is the reason I came back. He said, I had a choice. I could have stayed um, on independent study or I could come back. And he said, you know, the work that we do in this class, it really is, um, I'm paraphrasing, but it's really transformative. It's really um, useful um, to me. And um, I really feel like um, we're a family and I feel like I want to be here instead of at home independent study. And this is obviously before distance learning and all the things we're dealing with now. But I remember um, as a as a teacher, you know, I was really, I was flabbergasted in, in, in this situation because um, at the time I was actually struggling with the institution and struggling in my position, but to realize that that type of impact was happening in my classroom was extremely um, powerful and useful. And it really, I think it really elevated my perspective as a teacher, uh, as a young teacher and trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do. Um, and so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think it's clear that um, we're making a difference and the arts is extremely powerful. Great. Uh, Bill and Mary, do you want to show your, uh, share your impact story? Sure. I think what Bryce said about how teachers and education can make an impact on a personal level, I think that's the most important thing I personally took away from as a student. Um, for me, in senior year of high school, it, it, film, video arts, the media academy, it opened my eyes to not just the idea of having a voice, like everybody has said, but also the idea that teachers are very valuable. I think it might be relatable to, uh, to know that we've been in that place and that mindset as students where we think teachers are this abstract authoritative notion that are just not human. And I'm sure we all have students who are still in that same mindset, but it wasn't until I encountered people like my former, uh, my former teachers, James Gleason, Evelyn Subert, and Kathy Cohen over at Cleveland High School, they really, challenged me to develop my film style. They challenged me to take full authority over my projects as a film student. And they really listened and captured my attention and thoughtfully engaged with me as a student, uh, which made me realize, oh, these are people who understand what's at stake. They understand art. They're not just these abstract authoritative teachers who exist at the school in order to make us all mindless. No, they actually really do care very deeply about projects, about stories, about storytelling. Um, and in fact, one of my favorite memories from that time is when Kathy Cohen, who was, she wasn't even my advisor. She was the film school advisor at this high school. She had taken me to Sacramento for a film screening that my film was part of. And I thought, wow, this is someone who cares. I never would have had this opportunity 
if I didn't meet people like this? And I think the arts, especially media art, especially digital arts, it affords the opportunity for teachers and students to connect on a level that is not just memorizing facts. It is not just test taking. It is not just, for lack of a better word, the BS of education. It really is meaningful engagement because in order to make good art, you need to have good connections. So I think the most impactful thing for me was just the fact that arts education opened my eyes to the fact that teachers are these valuable co-conspirators and co-collaborators of any project. Wonderful, that was great. Um, Emily, how about an impact story for you from the classroom? Um, yeah, I think we can circle back to my summer internship last year and just how I really took what I had learned in my classes and my art classes and put it to practice. Um, and I think the passion that I saw and I like it reflected on the work I did. Um, I think that's where I realized that art really does impact, um, especially those who don't even realize that they're so passionate about it. Um, just like me. Um, and yeah, I guess my whole life, I really just thought I was going to be under like have a STEM career. But then I was like second guessing myself after my internship, I was like, well, I'm just introduced to a whole new world. And it's something I'm passionate about, and I really love. And so just having that and just like connecting myself with my art and really knowing that I can put myself out there and express myself. Um, it's something that I noticed that I really wanted for myself. And so, yeah, just having that exposure um, as a student is very important and for future life, life choices. As I said before, I am now thinking about film school. And so, yeah, I guess that's how it impacted me. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Our next question is, uh, why is me arts education so important? Um, and that's really hard to put into a nutshell, but I think that for me, uh, me arts education reflects the world that is around us, the world that we're living in, the world of the youth in particular, as they're developing and facing a global society, you know, a society that shares a lot of things now and it has a tight relationship across international lines. Um, and that this is the lexicon, the language of our contemporary society and students need to be versed in that. It's just common sense. Uh, I go back to writing the standards, leading the writing of the standards um, in California and nationally. Um, and one particular standard uh, I just picked out out of 22 at uh, this particular accomplished level in high school. It says, examine in depth and demonstrate the relationships of media arts ideas and works to various contexts, purposes, and values, such as markets, systems, propaganda, and truth. It's such a critical standard. <laughs> it needs to be something that every student in education, public education, K-12 has exposure to and has the capacity to work with, which is why we're working at this national level to try to establish this discipline and get it firmly embedded within contemporary education. Bryce, what do you think? What, why is so media arts education so important? You know, it's interesting that you asked this question because I was, I've been thinking a lot about it and talking to my wife and my students about it. And, you know, I think the consensus, the, the conclusion I should say that we've come to is that um, in the 21st century, um, what we do in digital storytelling is equivalent to English maybe 50 years ago. Um, in the sense that our ability to communicate on multiple platforms, the ability to communicate on a digital platform, your ideas, your thoughts, um, is not something that's optional anymore, I feel. I feel at this point, it's something that we will have to do. We're going to come to a crossroads where you're gonna need those skill sets. And um, you know, in our academy, I would say about 10% of our students 
um, go into the arts directly and the rest go uh, into, um, they go and they become lawyers, they become engineers and architects and all sorts of things. And I believe that all of these folks are going to be utilizing what we teach in the classroom. Actually, one of our students just went to Penn State uh, to become a lawyer. And so this is something that, um, you know, I feel is extremely important, uh, regardless of the direction um, um, folks are going into. But I realize that um, I think I think some people haven't quite they haven't quite got to the point where they realize that. But that's something that I think is very true about um, about media arts is it is extremely important uh, on multiple levels. And I also feel like um, in our in in the classrooms and in media arts, we we pull on all the other um, um, disciplines in order to do them. You know, we 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 write scripts, so we rewrite scripts, and we um, we pull on knowledge. If we're making a documentary um, that's in the science area, we need to know, we need to understand these things. And so, I think it's important to realize that it's um, it's collaborative as well. Great. Billy Marie, why is media arts education so important? Honestly, I'm going to bring it down to the basics of digital literacy. Uh, just like what Bryce said, there is a way to think about media arts, which expands beyond the arts field uh, and contributes to critical thinking and thoughtful analysis in any industry, in any field. And just like what Emily hinted at with opportunities, arts and especially media arts education affords opportunities. So I'm thinking very specifically of digital literacy in this age and age. In a world of deep fake videos, in a world where GameStop stocks can go sky high uh, thanks to Reddit threads, in a world where everything on Twitter, on TikTok, on Facebook, et cetera, can be taken as truth without active engagement. I think digital arts and media arts education can contribute to crafting more mindful engagement when it comes to uh, our engagement on an online digital world. We are no longer limited to our locale. We are a global world, whether we like it or not. Uh, we are able to converse with people in different time, space, locations. Because of that, we really need to be able to train the next generation to understand, just like what you said, Dane, with your standard. Okay, what does truth entail? How can we pick something apart to make sure that we're engaging with uh, the right type of mindset? How do we think about pro uh, propaganda? How do we think about what that might look like in the form of a meme, right? These are all things that our youth are taking in, but we're not actually teaching them how to deal with it. We're expecting that you just learn that knowledge uh, mm. without it. So I think, I think in this day and age, it's digital literacy that is the most important. And what that looks like, I, I leave it up to the experts, but I do honestly believe that that plays in a huge role in how the next generation is going to engage uh, with content online. Great, wonderful. Um, Emily, why is media arts education so important, do you think? Um, I'm gonna keep it short and say that because it brings people together, um, and I think it's whether it's collaborative work or independent art, um, people come together to appreciate what is made and what's, what is expressed and what people are trying to say through the art. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, we're kind of at time, aren't we, Aaron? And uh, we should now shift to the Q&A portion. So I'll get hand it over to Aaron now. Thank you That's so much to our panelists, by the way. Thanks to our, our panelists, I really appreciate the, we wanted to have a section where we could see, you know, people in various stages, educators, uh, 
professionals, students who could speak to their experiences in the media arts. And now we'd like to open it up for questions uh, and comments in terms of the initiative. Um, Jim is here and also if there's any other questions that we have. So let me just open a space. Uh, we'd love to hear about any questions you have about the initiative. We'd also love to hear about your stories. You know, what is the health of your media arts program? Are you concerned about your job in the fall? Are you concerned about, you know, what kinds of classes or opportunities you'll have as we move back to this face-to-face -face experience? So I'd invite anybody to, to, to comment or ask any questions that they might have. I'll just say, I'd like to thank, um, the panelists who spoke up and, and talked about their experiences, I thought that was really um, beneficial and I, and I appreciate them all for, for sharing with us. Where are you coming from, John? I'm just curious. I live in Kalamazoo. Well, I, I teach in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I teach in, and I actually work for an arts organization that's a countywide program. Um, so I guess it's, it's maybe a little different than, than what's described, but it, it's a, uh, we service like 14 high schools and uh, there's, we have dancer, like a, a dance is our biggest program, but dance, theater, um, visual arts, and then media arts. And so I teach like filmmaking and comic books and, and uh, graphic design and stuff like that. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions uh, from, from the audience here? Hi, it's Corey. Um, I'm Corey Wilkerson. I'm also with Jim Palmerini at EDTA, but also have been dabbling in media arts. And I just like to ask, I mean, maybe it's Jim that answers it, but you all have been so inspirational and I, I'm like all ready to go now. So what do I do? <laughs> What's the first thing I should do? What's the next thing I should do? How can I really make an impact? Jim, do you want to jump in and uh, maybe maybe jump with the first the first step there? I I think I would just ask a supplemental question to what Corey asked, which is, um, do you as both the field and an educator, let's say, feel um, apart or integrated with the other arts areas? Do you do you feel like you are given um, equal status within your uh, school or with even within the field? Do you think you have that recognition? That's a great I'm, question. I could try to answer that uh, for my own program, my own experience. In the particular situation I am right now, I, I feel mixed. <laughs> There's certain aspects of my program that are appreciated and supported. On the other hand, you know, I am really not relevant to the conversation, the core conversation, you know, core of the high school. And that's been a usual habitual situation within schools. And I've been in a number of schools and had a number of administrators. And the pattern has been, um, for the most part, the, the arts are neglected, they're sidelined, uh, they're not really paid much attention to, and they're sort of used for a minimal purpose in engaging students and keeping them coming to school. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I've had other administrators who were very supportive. Uh, my program flourished under them and the student work was just incredible that came out of that. So I've experienced both sides and um, so I, I think with the arts education coming together, all of the arts disciplines and working together, I think that's a powerful movement. And the more collaboration that it can occur at that level, the better. Well, I, I had a thought. I, I heard what was said about digital literacy. You know, there's a lot of discussion how the arts should communicate their value. Right now, the coin of the realm is social emotional learning. And it's, I think, perfectly le legitimate. I wonder, um, I, I would assume that there is a desire for there to be a lot more media arts programs in school than what there are. So I'm wondering if one of 
the keys to that is to communicate that, as was said, I think I got this, is that the next generation will communicate and engage through digital literacy. That makes so much sense to me. And I don't think everybody gets that. And maybe that's what needs to happen. And maybe, may interesting, I wonder if you want to hear from somebody else about this. And maybe where that needs to start is down in the elementary grades now. I'm not saying it's too late for those, you know, at the secondary level, but I mean, in terms of establishing programs and buy in from even parents who may actually get it, younger parents who are coming in who are digital natives and, and not immigrants, such as myself, <laughs> who would then, um, you know, want to emphasize to need for digital tools and for media arts programs. Just I'm, I'm wondering the way in. Thoughts? Jim, can you um, speak a little bit about how the campaign can help all of us advocate for our art forms? As I would think it's especially powerful for media arts who have the tools to tell their stories digi digitally to really share that impact. Is that a facet of that cam the campaign, kind of storytelling and sharing it, impact? It is. And, and in fact, that's interestingly, I, I think, you know, as the campaign grows, um, we are gathering very simple comments within the pledges. But, you know, what we would like to do is to begin to gather stories. And, you know, I'm a Luddite, you know, I love reading stuff. But the fact is, the way those will best be communicated is through videos or really however cleverly they can be presented through media arts uh, savvy individuals such as yourself. Those kinds of stories, I mean, what they, seems to me what they do at once is show, you know, the expertise. Let's say we had a series of stories that were told. Let's say, Bryce, you took your class and you assigned them to do, start them a prompt let me tell you why media arts is important. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that in a story in a way that you have never imagined it before. I, you know, whether that's through animation, however you'd wanna do that. So what that does at once is it, it, is it puts the wow on the discipline and the skills and the knowledge and the passion of the students. And it actually tells the story at the same time, if that makes sense. So, you know, that's, that's my thinking about the storytelling that the campaign is trying is trying to really put forth because, you know, we can we can do all the data sharing that we would like, which I mentioned before, but is real stories by real people and the impact, uh, especially now, especially now. Mm -hmm. Does that help? <laughs> I, I'd like to build on on what Jim is talking about here because I think, and, and again, it's it's in particular to this kind of special little community we have here of media arts, right? Because in my experience, both in the classroom as a high school teacher who worked in design and web design and computer coding. And then also as someone who now teaches teachers who constantly go out and invent media arts programs, yeah. that the media arts is kind of in this in-between space. And unless you have a, a district, a large district usually, that's able to do an academy model as Bryce was talking about or a magnet or you know whatever your, whatever your school system is using to, to mimic those kind of specialization schools, really the media arts professionals are working in these kind of in-between spaces. So conversations about you know teaching the subject matter that you're trained to teach. I mean, when I was teaching computer coding, I wasn't trained to teach that. I was self-learning with my students the whole time. And that's the, that's the energy of the media arts that I really love. It's about invention. And that's a space inside of these advocacy campaigns that I think is so important. Because, th and I think this is what our panelists were speaking to, that there's so much possibility that schools just can't seem to grab a hold of and that the media arts seem to find these in-between spaces and, and do that kind of invention work. That's been my experience, both working again with future teachers and also as a teacher myself. Um, and that, that would be the, the kinds of stories that I wanna elevate is that media arts professionals and educators, we are inventing educational spaces. We're inventing learning spaces that didn't exist before. Um, and I think that that's a very powerful story. I'd like to chime in here on this one. Uh, my name is Christine Salazar. I'm actually, I'm not an, an instructor. I'm actually a school board member and um, for the Housing La Puente Unified School District. And, um, you know, when, when you're talking about um, 
about this type of relationship with with programs at our schools in our district, I think it kind of goes down to also the uh, how the district and its board members and its admin actually encourages our instructors, encourages our programs to um, to share their stories. Sometimes, you know, uh, you know, I I actually just got real. I just got elected as a trustee, and you know, I actually my background was or is I'm a parent, I'm a community organizer, and I saw this huge disconnect from district, you know, board members and the admins with the community and its residents and its families and its students. And so for me, my main goal is to, to you know, kind of regain that trust, regain that connection. And, you know, I think with media arts, that is one of the best things that, you know, a district or even I would like to utilize uh, because, you know, there are so many stories out there. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a child that, you know, whose teacher actually utilizes videos uh, in their, in their, um, in their lesson plans. And so they always do like their own, like, you know, um, uh, they do a whole bunch of different videos and reporting back, whether it's in English language arts or whatever. But um, I think it's the bottom line is, is that myself as a, as an official, as a representative, a district employee, as a district, as a school board, we need to foster this encouragement, this confidence in our educators um, and not say it's a bad thing that you're speaking up or it's uh, we just want to see the good things about a district. You know, we want to see the challenges that we're raising, because especially in this day, in this age right now, especially during the pandemic, um, there's so many stories that are untold depression, anxiety, and there's so many stories out there that need to be to be heard. And I don't want to just listen about the rainbows and the unicorns. I want to hear everything. And just fostering that type of confidence in our educators, in our programs to say, let's step up and be a good for our community. Well, the media arts offer that for schools. It's a, a incredible communication medium. And in my school programs, I've always had students produce videos that were for the community at large and were able to tell the story of the student in compelling ways. And the thing about media arts education is we're, we're actually seeing through the eyes of our, our young people. When they produce media, we're seeing what they see. And it's, it's very unique in that way. And it's originally, and it's from students as student sourced uh, expression. And for them to decide exactly what they wanna say and how they wanna say it. Well, folks, I just wanted to, um, again, we're, we come to the end of our time and I want to thank everybody, uh, especially our panelists for spending time with us tonight. Um, for the folks who have contributed to the discussion here um, and uh, including congratulations on the new board membership. Uh, that's great to hear a voice um, speaking so powerfully. Um, there is a, a number of other town halls that are going on. Um, one right after this, that actually is for the NAEA, the National um, Art Education Association, which is more focused on the visual arts, um, a bit of a larger community. Um, and then there's other town halls that have to do with the various other dance and theater and things of that nature. But again, thank you for coming tonight and being a part of this focus on a smaller kind of fledgling community of, of media arts professionals. Keep your ear to the ground on, on movements around the Media Arts Committee, which again is trying to generate energy and, and putting together a kind of national organization which can better represent the kinds of inventive work that we're all doing. Uh, and with that, folks, thank you so much. Again, the, the, this uh, recording will show up somewhere online. I'm not sure where yet, but we'll make sure and get it out there. And uh, please do visit the site when you get a chance and sign the pledge. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Really great to see everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Have a good night.